Welcome back to the Flow Track Podcast. I'm here with sprint coach Carl Lewis of the Houston track team. A day after we just saw your alma mater on the basketball side qualify for the final four. Let's just talk about that. It's because on top of my mind, what was it like watching Houston make it to the final four? Oh, that was exciting. Um, for me, I, I just look at a couple of things. Number one, uh, I was classmates to the, the group that was by Slam Pajamas. So we were there at the same time. So I, I lived that experience with them and knowing what Guy Lewis and all of them built in the program. And then Coach Sampson and I came in the same year. So this is both our seventh year. And just to see what he did, he came in and created a confidence. Um, it was tough for him. The facility was tough. But the university was committed to helping that program become better. He's a great coach, very well respected. He was able to integrate the community because he came straight from the Rockets. Um, and he had a lot of success at the college level. And then what he did is he, he built the team and created a level of respect in the area where now all the local kids want to come to U of H and play basketball. We're getting all the best kids now. So, I mean, it, it, it was just phenomenal. It wasn't anything special. It was just something that they built over a number of years with a plan. They stuck to the plan. The university stuck to them. And they're exactly where they deserve to be. It's a great program. And and I I, I, I see them in a the championship game because it's, it's, it's interesting watching Arkansas and Baylor play Old Southwest Conference. And now um, we're playing Baylor Old Southwest Conference. But I think that Southwest Conference is going to be playing um, whoever's on the other side of the bracket. It's kind of interesting kind of following the way you know, I follow you on Twitter and some of your, your fellow uh, uh, athletes you coach on Twitter and the way they kind of look at the whole uh, power five versus non-power five. And, you know, when you're talking about like the football team, the basketball team here, how, you know, now they're going into final four. Um, and then on the track side where everyone's talking about power five, power five, power five and say, hey, well, look at us. Look at a team like North Carolina a and These teams, you don't need to be power five to succeed in the NCAA. Um, do you think that's now truer than ever? Well, I think what's happened now, um, and that's a great observation. Thank you. It's What's truer now is that the, um, of course, a lot of it's stacked because the, the media for the most part pushes power five. Um, and even when I started coaching, it was interesting because a lot of the parents and the people would say, well, I want to go to a power five school. And, and I remember my line was, well, I went to the Olympics four times I, I stood on the podium 10 times and i never saw a conference i just saw a person and the only time i lost was to somebody that was a not power five school u of h so um yeah I, I get that and and i don't blame anyone for trying to do whatever they can to get an advantage but but once you find your niche and like a t they found a niche they're bringing in the sprinters they're doing an excellent job uh coach ross is doing it and, and we we're we're fortunate because we have a brand name that had a past as well uh, but Houston, I mean, so Houston's the number one school, uh, I, I'm sorry, the number one place, I think, in the world for high school track and field. So that was how I was able to build it, and Coach Burrell was able to build it through just keeping people home. So you have to find the niche. And, and what I like about track and field, and, and even basketball especially, is that it's more exciting because there's more access. Uh, you the, the basketball tournament, it has it's open to every single conference so it's just interesting how every single year uh, everyone's in it and i think they've had more non-power five schools win than power five schools over the last 10 years or at least it's equal so so i think that it's the access and now in track and field the more people that do that the more access we'll get now I, I, since i've been here seven years i've noticed every single year more and more teams are qualifying for the ncaa and then you'll have teams like dakotas that are doing well A&T, um, Northern Arizona, you know, of course we're having success. So it's just a matter of time before um, we can get past that. And, and also with the media, you know, the way we can talk. Um, I think you have to build a brand and, and build a program where people respect you. Um, our thing is we're, we don't go after the biggest, biggest guys in the world. We don't give huge scholarships all the time. We take kids that really want to be here, that have talent. We develop them. And they make them better. And I think when when people see that, they see what are developing them. They're getting good kids. They're getting better. Then that's where you want to go. Speaking of uh, non power five versus power five, we just had the Texas relays. Kind of had a rematch between LSU and Houston. Uh, this this time Houston Houston came victorious. Uh, what was the weekend like at the Texas relays? Kind of 
the last time you were there was 2019 when you kind of had one of those great seasons and now you had a chance to kind of redeem yourself starting with the four by one. Well, it was, it was for me personally, it was amazing because we, we didn't have an indoor conference meet, which kind of killed our indoor season for the most part. Um, and so it was really challenging for me to get excited. I mean, we, the COVID year was great because I was off. I took the time. I focused on some other things and I didn't travel. And so, so it was really, really special for me. And then to come back and then to get your conference meet killed, that made it difficult. And then we ended up just taking Sean to nationals. And when that was over, it was over. So getting into Austin, it was the first time all year that I felt any nerves. I felt any energy about a season. And the kids were really focused on performing. And see, what made the challenge is that we had two relay teams and their objective was to go in and try to win both groups. That's what they wanted to do. Um, and then on the women's side, we wanted to, to get people to have personal best. So it was an absolute phenomenal weekend. And it wasn't a matter of just winning because we want to make sure that we run our best. LSU is a phenomenal team. Right now, they're the best team in the country. And in terms of our relay, that's something that we take pride in as a team. So we wanted to make sure that even though we didn't have really any practice um, or any competition, we had no meets to run for any of us for the relay. We wanted to make sure that we just were precise and um, showed what we can do. And we realized that we probably have the most speed in the country. We definitely have the most depth because we can we can have two teams that run fast. And so we just wanted to not make mistakes. And that was the thing I was proud about. Um, on the men's side, the men's team, both teams ran three races, really no mistakes. And it was the first time they all ran all year. So that was that was exciting. And I think that it just it's just great for our sport. There's a level of respect that is given back and forth. I think Terrence Laird ran a phenomenal 200. And I think a lot of that was because of the relay. It did get to him. So w there's nothing bad about this rivalry because they're a wonderful program that I respect. I respect Coach Shaver and Benny and them. And, and it only makes our track and field sport better. Was the 2019 viral moment of Travis Collins versus Flournoy still fresh in Travis's mind? Because Flournoy's not there anymore, but Travis and I guess three of the four guys are back from that 2019 uh, 4 by one Was that still fresh in their mind going into this race, being like, hey, it's been two years, it's time to right or wrong? Well, it's interesting because um, the of the people on that team, uh, first – was of course uh, Nick. Nick was there, and Travis were back. So two of the four are back um, in the program, and so he, you know, I didn't talk to him about it very much. We didn't make a big deal because when you're on there with nine billion views, and you have all these people, first of all, that are saying, "Oh, basically, you got punked. You were pushed. He ran you down." And and I went to Travis. I said, "Look, Florida is a great kid, and I know he got excited, and there was a lot of backstory to that." in terms of what happened in competitions previous, especially that day. Um, I said, so just leave it alone. And at first he was like, coach, they're killing me. So um, that happened. Then, of course, it turned around and they respected the fact that he was man enough to stand up. Well, then when we get here, um, it's two years later. And I knew that, number one, U of H LSU rivalry is tough. Number two, it's his first time back on that track, in that environment, in that situation. He was not running anchor. But he's back there. So I knew there was a nerve level with him. And I knew he was uh, anxious about it. So I tried to keep it calm as possible and not talk about it very much because of that. And, and I was really proud of the way he ran, the way he handled himself. When we uh, get ready for this outdoor season, what are your ultimate goals for what you think this version of the Houston men can produce come, you know, nationals up in June? Well, as a team, we're really excited about what we can do. Um, we're obviously strong in the sprints, as we have been. Um, our, Jermaine Hole is back in the 400. Uh, Dio is, is coming along in the high hurdles. Quavell, who started off very well last weekend, is in the intermediate hurdles. Um, we've got some good pole holders um, and long jumper. So, and throwers, you know, right now, we're, we're, we're a lot more, um, I guess, quality across the board than we have been really in a long time, probably ever. So we're excited about that. And in terms of the sprints, uh, we, we have people that can win the 100, that can win the 200, that can win the 4 by one I mean, that's something that we enter a season um, with that goal all the time. Who's going to be the one that wins 100? How many can we get into the final um, or the 200? We haven't had a 200 finalist in a while. So who's going to be the one that breaks through there? 
So it's not it's not a bra brag no show. That's just something that they set the goal. And then they came to me and talked about the relay, and they want to run 37. You know, it got to where the energy here is that um, we have to work hard to make sure that we own uh, the relay record. They want that relay record back, and it, it was phenomenally run, but they want it back. And being such a young team, we have three sprinters out of 16 and that are seniors and two that are juniors. And the rest are all freshmen and sophomores. So we're, we're a team. I mean, the other day, for instance, each team, the first team and the second team, they only had one senior. And so um, we're a really young team. And the, the kids want to get out there, establish themselves this year. They'd like to get the title back. And then they want to continue to make a run like we started the first time. And so uh, they feel like it was a blip for us to drop the baton and not be in the final and have a shot. And, and so they want to show that, that we're really the program. H-Town Speed City is the fastest group in the world. And, and um, they want to show it and be consistent about it. We now have done a few months of, quote, normalcy in track and field because we're having a season. We had an indoor NCAA championship. We're presumably going to have an outdoor NCAA championship. Uh, what have been the pros and cons that you've seen of the way we've kind of gotten back to track? whether it's the way meets are run or the lack of meets or the different types of meets that we're getting, what have you noticed in this kind of trial run of doing track and field in an era of COVID? Well, um, I think one thing that we've all noticed, and that's probably across the board in sports, is how technically little control the NCAA really has. Um, the, the control um, is then they control the nationals, the conference controls the conferences, and then the, the teams control themselves. Uh, so there's just there's just no real top down leadership that can say, well, we're all running or we're not running. Here's the protocol or isn't the protocol. Each conference has their own way of testing, their own way of events. Some are in, some are out. And, and I, I just think that that's been the biggest challenge for all of us. Um, because if, if, if you look at the conferences that ran all year, they made a tremendous commitment to make sure that they're giving their student athletes the absolute best opportunity to compete. Well, if you pull a conference meet like we did, one of the few, then all of a sudden you're not committing. To, to the national championship. And so you kind of took a season away. So that that's the, the big challenge and of, of this year is that there really is no way for a broad sweeping, okay, this is the way the testing is going to be. These are kind of events. The, uh, every single venue has to do X, Y, Z. And we're going to have nationals. We're going to have conferences. But because it's just, it's just too difficult to have all these different things. And that's not just tra track and field. That's all sports. I mean, our conference, believe it or not, only cut track and field indoors. So every other sport had their conference, which we were happy about. But it just doesn't make sense that you can't find a way to have track if you can have swimming and volleyball and all the other indoor sports that they're doing. What uh, are we, are we going to have? Your is your conference going to compete outdoors, like uh, championship? Yes. Yeah, we're going to have our outdoor championship, um, and we're moving along. It, it's a different energy right now, and, and they understand that. And the thing about it, just because of that conference meet, it's different. I mean, we started the season. Uh, indoors and we just never got anything going and what it ultimately ended up was some of our conference team came to three home meets because we have an indoor facility and and for the men's sprints it was some sometimes it was like a scrimmage and then the seniors couldn't run so they weren't engaged and that was it but outdoors um it's, it's full speed ahead and you could tell by our performance our first meet we had it was okay to get started and everyone had run um in so long and then our second meet with Texas Relays, it, it was phenomenal. The performances were different. The energy was different. So you don't realize that even though Houston men have not lost a conference meet since 2015, indoor or out, you don't realize how much energy you put into that. Because we, we look back and did a study with us, and about more than 60% of the athletes qualified for nationals at the conference meet. So that, that that's a different energy. And I think that cutting back um, the regional – from 48 to 32 is also raises um, a, a little bit for them. And I think um, they're a little misguided. Uh, I'm not against lowering the number of the regional, to be honest, but I think in a COVID year, it's not fair because we have seniors that should be gone with freshmen that are just coming in. And it's just going to make it difficult for the new athletes to make it. Although in, in a non-COVID year in the future, I'm not against lowering the um, the regional number from 48, but definitely not this year. Yeah. 
speaking of that, the forty eight to thirty two, I had a few takes where like what if you're getting if you're the fortieth fastest in the West region, you're not really gonna be a factor in a national championship caliber meet. Uh you know, maybe there's that one person who sneaks in and gets twenty fourth at nationals, but that's far and few between. I thought I think the NCAA was saying, hey, we need to go from forty eight to thirty two for COVID. They're saying that, but I think in reality they were just doing it to save money. Is that a good like? Does the NCAA pay for all the regional athletes to go to regionals, and that's so they kind of save their money by not having to pay for forty eight athletes per event instead of thirty two? Well, um, here again, I uh, it's it's unfortunately in a lot of cases, uh, COVID's been used to save money with programs and different things. But but no, the the comp- the teams do actually pay for for the um, to go to regional. But think about it this way. So the NCAA does not pay for it, but the teams do. So a lot of the athletic directors um, don't want to pay for regional. And so we, we're, we're as teams are sitting here talking about the frustration of it. Well, it's really your athletic departments. And it's not I'm saying anyone else's. I'm saying period across the board. And, and, and another thing, too, in the argument, like you said, some of the people may get in. But, you know, you, you look at like sprinters or distance runners or things like that. Um, that are in the 30s and 40s. Many cases, they could be in the top 24. They just qualified and went to nationals. A couple of years ago, we had Elijah Hall, who just, um, his leg was bothering him. So he ran conference, ran 10-24, and that was it. And so to, he, and he was probably in the 20s or something like that, and he went into to regional. Well, if he had to, he could have run faster. And so I think that the argument of the, the occasional person at 47, 48, it's, it just doesn't really hold a lot of water. Um, but I, and I understand the frustration of athletes that are at that level um, that don't get a chance to go to regional. But we're also uh, trying to see if we can change the regional system, which would make it easier because um, Coach Burrell Leroy put in a proposal to make the, the regional meet match the, the national championship meet the same schedule because it is a much tougher schedule to do the regional than the nationals. So from, from my perspective, absolutely not should have uh, should not have done it this year because of COVID in the future to me, if they do it, I don't, I don't see a problem with it. Yeah. I'm looking at 2019 for you guys. Uh, you had a lot of people go to regionals and I think especially in the 100 and the 200, I think you only had one guy outside the top 32 in the hundred and then two guys outside the top 32 in the 200. So majority of your one and two guys would have still qualified for regionals right, right. if this was and, happening and, in 2019. And, and, and the, and the thing about it is that um, it, it's I, I know it's a challenge. I know it's difficult, but we in our sport have to um, not worry about uh, the mid majors. And I think that, that and I don't mean not worry about them. I, what I want to do is say, look, let's just talk about how well they're doing, how well uh, a lot of these mid major schools doing, like I mentioned earlier. And they, they can elevate their game. They're doing a great job coaching in a much more challenging situation because they don't have the budgets that the big schools have. But I, I just think personally, those schools will rise up. You, you, every year now, you're seeing more and more athletes coming from non-Power 5 schools having success because they're finding great coaches and great programs and great communities. And, and what I, I don't think it will hurt those in the long run. I think in, in a lot of ways it helps them because now kids are looking at where can I go that I can be um, the best I can be. Well, I may not want to go to a power five school because I already have seven sprinters. I want to go to a school where I can, I can, they can focus and bring me up individually uh, or me as with a relay team or something of that nature. So I, I don't think it'll hurt as much after the COVID is, is over with as people think it will. But, um, and I just think that most of those schools have really good coaches and programs that they'll just end up rising up. One thing you used to say to me a lot when we were to have our, like, our side conversations when we were filming the uh, the Houston s- series back in 2019, we talk about ways to fix our sport, right? And we would talk about, oh, like, IWF should do this or they shouldn't do that. And uh, one, one uh, th- thing you kept on harping back on was that we have too many professional athletes. And because of that, it's harder to maintain – a structured professional sport when everyone calls himself a pro. Can you kind of elaborate on that of what do you mean by that? Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Um, I think the biggest problem we have at the 
professional level, obviously, is the federation system. Um, we, we're not a professional sport because we're run as an amateur system. But in terms of the athletes, we just have too many in the sport. And so when you graduate, there is no finite number like NBA or NFL or whatever. They have finite numbers of how many can be on the team. So you're, you're, you're limited. But we just have people all over the world um, that continue to run. And what it does, it pulls resources from the people that actually need to be there. Um, my, my idea is to create like a like a, uh, a world league in terms of not necessarily events, but just a, a league of certain amount of people. And then you have like a, a B league and a B league uh, is something at a certain level. Let's say you pick 32 or so and they're in the A league and that's it. And you have to fight your way in. And just like we have um, in soccer in a lot of cases, the bottom people drop out. If there's an injury, they could be replaced. They're moved up. Just like you have the 10-day contract, you can move up and in and maybe they come back and you're back down because we need to have competition to be at the top level of our sport. And, and the way that would help is it's easier to get lanes for meets. Uh, the meets can focus on less people. Uh, we'll end up having less agents because there are way too many agents in the business. Um, and then the ones that are the second level, we can, we, can we can focus more development money on them. Like right now, they're giving everyone development money. Well, if you set this league, well, that development money can shift to that to those levels, and and then the top level, with less competition in terms of people, they can make more, so they don't need that. So they their job is to build the professional side of the sport, and then the second level, because we hear about oh, we're, you're you're cutting out people, development people. Well, it's it's not the sport's job to sit here and wait for people to become good. You know, it's it's, it's our job to give opportunity to the ones that are going to move up the ladder. So. Um, that's my biggest thing. And then, of course, the biggest elephant in the room is the federation system, which is completely designed for corruption, the way it's one vote, one country, um, and everything is, is there for the top people to convince the bottom people to vote for them. And instead, we should create a, a system where the federations have to earn their right to get votes or to have power. And I would do that through a merit system based on championships, development, um, uh, per capita performance um, and also investment. These are things that, that small countries could end up earning more votes than big countries because they can do those things and be more focused on, on their own sports. So the biggest, the biggest thing really is federation change and we've got to shrink the top level of the sport. It's interesting. You said the idea of shrinking the top level of the sport with different tiers. Cause I was thinking about this, right? Every year, USATF Foundation announces like who is getting funded, like for like, they hey we're giving these uh grants to these athletes, and the people who are getting the grants are not the people who really need the grants. It's like going to like the world champions, and they're like, it's kind of like we if we have this pot of money, why are we giving it to the people who have, you know, six figure contracts, and not to the people who are like good but don't have six figure contracts it's kind of weird how it's like you know does a person who's making a million dollars need a 60 grand grant i don't i think it's a waste of 60 grand you know what i mean so well the thing about it is that the problem is that we have so few people that are making that are really earning a good living in track and field um that many of them want that grant but but uh, but under the plan we're talking about and uh, shrink it then none of them would need it they wouldn't need it because they'd be making two, three, four, five times more than what they make. And and so now they're they're earning more, so they don't worry about the grant. And then you could take those grants and fund that second tier, which let's say the B League. You could fund them, give them and give them a period of time. You know, you can't say we're gonna fund you for 10 years, but you give them a period of time to get either the, into that A League or or back and forth, because it, the objective is to incentivize performance. Because in, in the G League and the NBA. You're playing to get in the A League. You're getting the NBA. You're best. You're, you're every day. You're trying to, to play better to be seen to go. Well, in track and field, there really is no thing. You just want to say, I want to be in the Olympics. If you're a person that that qualifies for the Olympic trials and goes out in the first round, technically you have the exact same goal that the person that's in the Olympic that goes to the Olympic Games and makes the team. So, what if we change that? We we funded this the second tier group more and took the funding out of the first tier group. But, but our objective is to make it small enough where the same amount of money that's going into it now stays there. Now they earn a real living. It's a real professional sport. And then we have a developmental part of it at the bottom. 
they'll have meets where they'll still earn some money and things like that. It just won't be the same. I think that it'd be a much better system for us to go forward with. When you you kind of see multiple eras of track and field, you have the eras when you were a young buck, when you were in your prime, you know, and then now as a coach, uh, seeing a different generation. Um, and also that middle part where you kind of weren't a coach or running, but you're just watching from the sideline. Um, what do you think is the difference between the multi the different eras of track and field that you have seen, I guess, compared to like during your prime, during like the Usain Bolt era, and then the current era? Well, um, I came in, I made my first national team, U.S. national team in 1979. Um, and we were still an under the table amateur sport. Um, and so it was a different thing where it was kind of a, hush, hush, you're making money. and But but we were not considered professional. And then I realized at a young age that if, if you're going to be a professional sport, we have to change the rules. Because at, at 17 and 18, I was like, I want to be a pro, I want to be a millionaire. That was my my whole mantra. But then I realized, wait a minute, where you can't be a millionaire if no one makes a million dollars. <laughs> so my era was really about the seismic change of becoming professional. We fought for that. It wasn't just there's myself, you know, Edwin Moses, Evan Ashford, uh, a lot of the road runners were, were very instrumental in it. You look at someone like uh, the New York Marathon, all these people were coming to get Fred LeBeau, all these people were coming together to make our sport professional. And, and I didn't name all of them, but there are so many people. And we were fighting for that all the way through the 80s. And by the time the 90s came, we were considered professional athletes. And then we were professional athletes. And we went through the 90s. Well, once we, the difference I see in that era and this era is we were fighting for something. And, and I used to call our era the professional amateurs because we were amateur athletes fighting for professionalism and acting like it. Now I think that the issue now is that we're the amateur professionals because they, they, they didn't take it to the next level. And so they're professional in a professional world, but they're really running their business like amateurs. And I don't mean like uh, bad, but I mean in the mindset of what an amateur would do. Uh, they're not running it like a CEO since that's what you are of your own career. And so that's been going on now for over 20 years. Um, once we started the Diamond League, which was previously the Golden League, um, the, the IAAF cannibalized most of the sponsors, pulled them into their house. And they have not shown that they're good stewards of sponsorship because they haven't raised a lot of money. They haven't raised uh, the value of the sport. We're not getting more. Uh, just a perfect example is the World Championship to 97. They had a great deal. That was kind of like at the peak. Uh, of where we were financially in terms of uh, where the money was going. And the world championships, they got a car, a Mercedes. They made $60,000 for a win. And um, people understood it. The stadiums were full. They were 40, 50, 60,000 seat stadiums. Well, here we are uh, almost 30 years later, and the car is gone. The $60,000 is still there, but that $60,000 value is now 33000 And you only need a stadium of 20000 to be approved to have the worlds. So it, it's pretty obvious to see that it's been on a steady decline and nothing in the last 20 years has slowed that decline. You know, I, I know that Sebastian Coe is, is very smart and has great ideas, but I think that the sport is stuck in a structure that's just impossible to succeed. So that's, that's really the biggest different era. The era was exposed once he became professional in the nineties, it was all exposed. And, and you have to continue to fight the Federation to get a change. And they just they have not changed, but the sport has changed dramatically. You know, when, when I was drafted by the Dallas Cowboys in 1984, um, I, that year I made more than all the NFL players. Um, and through endorsements and, and, and appearance fees and everything else, I made more than all of them. So, so it was never an issue of going to play with Dallas. Um, nowadays, their money has gone incredibly but ours has basically stayed the same for just a few um i'd say 60 percent of the meets that were around in the 1990s are gone worldwide it's not just america gone worldwide many of the stadiums no longer have tracks in them anymore um the schedules have just gotten more and more crowded with federation type events with no coordination so there really has, has just been floundering without any really new ideas for all these years and so now we're kind of backs against the wall and the system is not designed with the Federation set up to change. So that's the problem. Now, um, Sebastian basically trying to change the sport with, with an iron and, you know, a big ball and chain on his ankle 
trying to pull it. It's just not going to happen unless there's seismic change at the structure of what we do and how we run our sport. Yeah, I I always f- have fun, like I'm not fun, but talk about ways to improve the sport uh, structurally. And like you said, you're talking about, hey, we need to shrink the number of considered pro athletes, which I think is a smart move because if everyone is a pro, then you kind of dilute the product and then you can't focus it on the right po- moments. Right, um, right. Well, and if everyone's a pro, no one's a pro. Exactly. That's, yeah. That's the, that's the problem we're in. Yeah, because – it every just becomes an open invitational. It's not an actual pro invitational. It's just an open meet. It's a local 5K, which are great, and local 5Ks can make money, but no one is watching a local 5K the same way they're watching an NBA basketball game. It's right, different. Exactly. So, uh, or, or, but, or March Madness, like last night. <laughs> yeah, March Madness, man. Where you, where you, uh, one, one idea I had was that because we're an individual sport, that when I look at what's individual sports right now that aren't, you know, the basketball, like the individual sports that are successful, they don't have a global championship. They don't have one week a year that matters. They have four global championships every year in the major system, right? You have Wimbledon, French Open. So tennis has four majors. Golf has four majors. And you get to see Tiger Woods and Serena Williams win four times a year, not just win once a year or for track and field once every four years, right? Because they only care about the Olympics or whatever. So I'm thinking that we should get rid of world championships and just have four majors, tie it to major marathons. So people are in town to watch it. You have the Berlin Marathon on Sunday. You have you have prelims on Thursday and Friday and then finals on Friday, on, on Thursday and Friday and then finals on Saturday and Sunday with the Sunday morning being the marathon. Perfect four day meet. That's how long a golf tournament. Is. It's four days. Boom. Thank you very much. Do it in Boston or New York or Berlin or Tokyo. Do you think uh, that's a good idea? Or I'm I'm, I'm anywhere. With no, that I, idea? I, think I think it's a great idea because first of all, um, you establish weekends every year that people look forward to. Now the World Championships is every two years, and and in reality, since it's bouncing around all the time, you're trying to find sponsorships for an event that's going to be inconsistent. Um, so let's just say you said Berlin, of course, New York, uh, London. I mean, these are places, Tokyo, I and mean, these are places you could do that. And they're huge cities that could that could um, bring in a lot of money. I remember when um, the New York Marathon was small in the 70s and it was building. And look, at it's, it's huge now because it's been there. It's consistent. Everyone takes that weekend off and that's it. And then another thing, too, if we shrink the, the top level of athletes and instead of having it well, every country has a certain amount of people, we bring it down to the best people, then there can be four days because you don't have so many athletes, you don't have so many rounds. And that's one of the things I think the NCAA does well is they send a small amount to nationals and so they can have a tight meet. Um, the indoor meet at 16 is really tough because, I, for instance, I think they could move that to 24 and add more to get more opportunity and access. But still, 24, you can run three heats like they do outdoors, and that's it. But look how tight the NCAA meet is. And you could do the same thing at Worlds. If you went to 32, then instead of four, three and four rounds, you could do uh, two and three rounds. The distance races could be two rounds. Um, in some cases, there would only be one. The 10,000 could only be one race like, like it is, or maybe the 5,000. So, so uh, And then these cities can get ready, ready for it. You know, you look at a, a New York marathon, and – the New York Marathon, if it added the it, – instead of the New York Marathon, it's the New York Athletics Weekend. Look look what it would be if you had the track meet all weekend and then the marathon on the weekend. You have 50,000 runners, but you'd have a huge weekend, and I, I think it's a tremendous idea. And then on the outside of that, you still can have your regional, like your European championships and uh, Asian, African, uh, Pan Am games. You can still have those, but put those at the same time so that you're leaving the schedule at the same time instead of crisscrossing that and consolidating the entire global schedule so that everyone's in the same place at the same time, just like they do in a lot of cases of sports. I know tennis and golf have different golf tournaments on weekends, and that's fine. But when you have your majors, everyone clears out for those majors, and that's something the track and field could and should do. Yeah, because even as someone who who doesn't even follow golf or tennis – 
when I see, you know, a major on, I'm going to watch it. Cause I'm like, Oh, okay. This isn't important. You know, I want to see who wins, but, and I, I get that four times a year. So I get that, you know, four times, 16 times every four years, whereas track athletes get that three times every four years because they don't, there's an off year and you know, then the Olympics, right? So 16 right. champions in four years versus three champions in four years. It's easy. It's better to have 16, you know? So. Yeah. But you have to also look at the context in this. Okay. And, and this is just a reality. So when Fred LeBeau and got the New York Marathon or Chicago, when those marathons put together, they're put together by business or rock and roll marathons. They're put together as a business. Um, and they've grown tremendously. The U.S. championships, and they're put together by federations, and they're declining. So it's not rocket science that if you take it and you and you con consolidate them to the idea that you have those marathons, and they're 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 for profit businesses, those events, um, instead of run by federations and people, then you'd see that. And then you really don't have to have uh, the national championships because you don't have a world championships. So, so you, these events serve as those championships, just like the U.S. Open for years yeah. was, was the U.S. championships. Well, the ones in the United States kind of evolve into that. And so we get away from a national champion every year to a champion of that. They don't really have a national championship for tennis um, or golf. They, they, they use their, you know, they have their events, which are like that. But um, the reality is that we need to find ways to be innovative, bring the running community into track and field stadiums, um, and get track and field to respect the running community more, uh, the general running community more, and make sure that we look at our sport as a whole, as a business, in order to grow. Because right now, it's declining so fast that I just don't see where the kids I'm even recruiting are going to have a sport to go to to earn a living. I remember one time you were just, – just, things that might change. You, you sent me a text message a few months ago about uh, the way NCA does uh, false starting. And uh, with uh, officials, do you remember, you remember you saying that? You, can, oh, yeah. Well, what was on your mind that, that kind of triggered your upsetness about what was going on in a, in a track meet with an official and a, a false start or a disqualification? Well, um, what happens is that the false start, the starter, they say, is like the guy of sport. It, it, it's They're omnipotent. And that's a big problem. We had an athlete uh, where a starter was really incompetent. And they would hold the athletes and of course they'd flinch because they're holding them so long. And then they'd say, they say, stand up. Uh, that's a warning. Well, that's not a warning. You know, if you flinch, then if you're, you're getting people on every heat flinching, then there's something you're doing incorrect because you're there for them. So um, what bothered me was that it doesn't really matter because starter has no um, recourse. There's nothing you can do. And that's it. And so we had a day um, where this is starting was just, embarrassingly bad one kid um, actually fell out of the blocks because the person held the gun forever and then the next time i don't want the problem they shot him immediately the kid was shot he actually fell and rolled on the on the track out of the blocks so um it made me thinking about officials in general if the officials there really is no recourse against officials um if you are in the major professional sports those officials are being evaluated constantly they don't go to national championships or they don't go to uh uh, the Super Bowl or anything like that, if they have a bad evaluation. Well, I've had situations where officials are amazing because most of them are very good. They, they work hard to do it. But we've had some that are just incompetent. And then next thing you know, they're nationals because they're a friend of someone. Um, uh, or uh, they're just, they just hire you. And so then I know that we'll hear like, well, they don't pay us to do this. Well, that's part of the problem. We're, we, if we had a for-profit business that was actually running the sport, we should be paying our officials. They should get travel. They should get all these things. It should not be a volunteer thing. We should treat it seriously. So my thing is that if, if you can complain, they can evaluate, and someone can be either docked or said, you're not going to nationals. You're not getting this because of your performance. And I think it'd be better. And on the false start in itself, I, I'm at the point now where I, I think we need to stop Get, change the way we even look at this false start. You know, right now we um, we do it and we'll bring them back to the blocks and bring them back to the blocks and go over. You know, if we got to where the athletes understood, we're not stopping the race. And it just is what it is. We're not going to stop it. It's going to go. And then we go and look at it and you're disqualified like every other event. Um, at first it'd be a challenge because the athletes would always stop. But we just said, look, don't stop. With the gun is shot and someone gets out, you run your race, it's over. 
then um, you go back to someone to protest, he jumped. And protest, now you have video, it's easy to see. And that's it. I, I just think that the, the way it is, um, it's really inconsistent. It's difficult. Starters are different. They do different things. That's not always bad. But if we're not constantly evaluating the starters, then we need to go to videotape because it's just embarrassing how bad some starters have been, especially in a year of COVID when you don't have a lot of meets. And if you miss one meet or something happens, then that may cost you your season. What, uh, speaking of COVID and there's not a lot of sports going on, I'm a huge Philadelphia sports fan. I know you also are a big Philadelphia sports fan. Have you been uh, following um, your uh, Philly teams much? And I, I guess one thought that I had right away was there were rumors that James Hart. So this is a podcast we talk about track, but me, my co-host Kevin, who's out because uh, his wife just had a baby. Um, we love talking about the NBA in our podcast, and he's a Spurs fan. I'm a Sixers fan. And there was a rumor that James Harden was going to be traded to Philadelphia. You have kind of a connection to the Houston Rockets. You know, I know you know Tillman, Farida, uh, and you know you 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 kind of have two homes, right? You have the Houston home and the Philadelphia home. Right. During that time when James Harden almost was traded to Philadelphia, did you know anything about that? And did you know like, hey, no, he wasn't going to be traded there. You knew he was going to go to the Nets. What were your thoughts on that whole like week of will James Harden go to Philly? Right, right. The bond, you know, really. The, the energy wasn't there. So <laughs> I didn't I didn't see that happening at all. And of course, as you know, I grew up in South Jersey, so I'm a, I'm a, a Philly and Houston fan. I mean, I grew up there in my parents' house and I became, you know, became an adult here in my own house. So I'm a big fan of both both uh, cities and still follow them in all the sports, um, whether it's the Texans or uh, the Rockets or the, the, the Dash and the Dynamo. So so I'm a big, big sports fan on both sides of Philly, but I, I didn't see that happening. The, the energy just didn't feel right. And um, I, I thought that the Sixers, they, they did done a tremendous job. They're really playing well. They've got a good young team, and, and they're going to be very successful. Yeah. And then our Eagles, man. Howie Roseman. Ooh. <laughs> the Eagles. Okay, so – that's a different story. I, I think that uh, I, I'm, I'm a little confused about what's going on with the Eagles. I know they have coaching and everything, but I think the, the, you know, the problem is at the very top, and, and that is the general manager. I just don't see the Eagles really getting it together until um, they change general managers, and, and it's just not there. And so it, it's interesting how the it, it's just like they're dancing around the truth and trying to change all this thing around the truth. And, and not dealing with the reality. I just don't see the Eagles having uh, a successful program until Rossman is not no longer there. Hot take. I mean, that's not really a hot take. I mean, a lot of people are probably feeling that way right now, right? But with the, what happened with the Carson Wentz situation and all that good stuff. But man, I, I went. One thing I wish about our sport track is that if you look at other sports like the NBA, Major League Baseball, and NFL, there's so much debating and content and conversation around draft free agency trades contracts like having a good contract versus a bad contract there's so much content around stuff that isn't even the game that they're playing that everyone wants to talk about the trade deadline and the, the draft and this free agency and the gm everyone's talking about the gms and the owners but no one is talking about that in the sport of track and field do you think that uh, the fact that we don't have that is a reason that kind of holds back our popularity because people like debating super teams and this, this that, and the other thing. Well, um, I think there are a few things to unpack in, in that question. Number one, we used to have sponsored teams. And so, uh, and they would technically recruit to get athletes to them back in the, back in the eighties and nineties, we had obviously Santa Monica track club, Athletics West, uh, Puma Energizer, uh, Foot Locker. We had those teams, and it was kind of that situation. But here, here's here's what's what's really going on with that, and which which is a great question. We have no ownership of professionalism. You know, you you just say uh, you're a high school kid or a college kid or whatever, and you say, "Well, I'm turning pro." Well, there is no real mechanism for turning pro other than saying, "I'll take money." So they. The leagues own all the information. They have their own television networks, radio networks, XM radio networks, um, 
They promote everything that happens. It, it, and we don't do that. We don't even have um, – in the NFL, you have to report to the NFL or these leagues if you're in or out. You know, we don't do that. We don't – There, I, I proposed 15 years ago that if you want to become a professional athlete, let's do it through the federations uh, or, or go to the next level. You, There's a, a code of ethics and something you sign to say, I am now a professional athlete and I'm denouncing my amateurism or whatever you want to call it, college eligibility. And I am able to do it. Now, all of a sudden, you're in a centralized place. Then there's a real press conference. There's talk about it. You know that technically you draft yourself into this league. You can have, like I said, a code of ethics. So, therefore, we can fight things and understand a lot of the issues. And then we'll start talking about, well, who's the new signees this year? Who's the new person this year? And if we started getting sponsored teams back again, instead of just having all these training groups and accepting that, then all of a sudden, after you announce that, now it's like, well, what team is he going to go to? What's go so we could create that. They created that. The, the, the draft was not a big deal. It was a one-day show um, in the in the eighties, and now it's a three-day television extravaganza. The um, the uh, combine. These are all television shows because they focused on television. They focused on all this. They have their own networks to present those things, but we don't own any of that, and so. If you, you, you can't have those things unless you have a mechanism that's put in place to make sure that you can present it. If we just simply did that, then all of a sudden, the um, now you're getting teams to say, well, this person turned professional. So now the teams are going out saying, I want to get you to join my team. So maybe the, maybe um, like a lot of the kids on our team are with Nike Red Bull. Well, now all of a sudden, Nike Red Bull has an incentive to go out and say, we're going to pay you this to run for our team because we want the best team possible. But right now, they don't have that. See, see, our sport lives by the individual concept. And, and so at the corporate level, it's best to divide and conquer. At the federation level, it's best to divide and conquer so that they have no power. Well, the power comes in these other leagues because they have a union because everyone's together. So really, if, if they started with that area and then really focused energy on getting sponsored teams back, we don't need teams in cities. That's just not going to work. But if you had sponsored teams all around the country, like we have other um, sports and around the world, rather, then those teams would be the ones that want to go out and find the best athletes. And if we have a centralized mechanism for turning professional, then that's that, then then that's another area where we know who is and what's going on. And then they would be distributed to certain leagues. Like you're in the A league, and that's all these sponsors. You're in the B league, and that's all these kind of sponsors. So we we just have no me everything is just open. I, I'm turning pro tomorrow. And so then I sign an agent and then I go get a new contract. That's not professional. Um, the sport has no control of anything, not to television message, um, not radio, not XM, nothing. And, and it, it, you can't expect to have that if you don't have any cohesive message and, and a situation where these athletes have somewhere specific to do it, to go to. Because right now, the athletes at the University of Houston, H-Town Speed City, I'm the one that really determines who's going to go to the next level. They're good enough, they go. If, if not, they're like, I still want to run. I'm like, dude, it's a wrap. You know, get a job because you're not going to make it. And that's not a mean thing. It's just like, it's, you're not there. So get you came in to go to college. You had a great career. Use that to move on to the next level. And we have to be more honest about that. One last thing about uh, making making money. Oh, it's just like, oh, you're professionally go pro. The NCAA um, is kind of battling with uh, image and likeness and with the change of times where now these 18 to 22 year olds have thousands and some cases millions of followers on social media platforms that they actually have the ability to be influencers and make money based off their image and likeness if they are you know trevor lawrence of clemson football team or a really you know sydney mclaughlin during her time she was probably more famous than anyone else in the track and field community could probably have made money as a freshman in Kentucky. What are your thoughts on that? And do you think eventually the NCAA will allow um, athletes to make money off of their name, image, and likeness? Well, first of all, if anyone knows me, they know I'm for athletes' rights and making money. So let's just let's just take that off the table, 100%. Um, and and I, I think it's going to be sooner rather than later. But, but I look at it in a broader perspective. I think that the names you mentioned, the people you mentioned are exactly right. But I'm also talking about 
We have international athletes, their home countries. Um, what about a car dealership that wants to give you a car or a, a, a small restaurant that wants you to promote them? So it's not going to be just the big football player or big basketball player, like a lot of people say, that get an endorsement. Yes, they'll get that. But you'll have um, athletes that can get local deals. You'll have athletes that'll get, that will get in track and field and get shoe contracts. I think it's better not just because the athletes make money. Because if you look at some of these great athletes, they can stay in school. So, so you you can make as much money in school as you can get out. Why, why, why not just stay and have the university pay your scholarship and get your degree and be a part of the team? Because at our, our level in track and field, you get more attention in college in the United States. You get more television time in college in the United States than you do post-collegiate. So you can build a brand where a chess read a few years ago stayed in and look what he did for his brand or Grant Holloway. Um, they did for their brand. But there are a lot of kids that left early and they, in a lot of ways they disappeared because there's no television. There's no attention given at that level. So I think it's the best of both worlds for track, track and field, for tennis, for these kind of sports because they can stay in school, be a part of a team, get a lot of exposure, but also get paid. And I think it's going to be a lot sooner than later. Do you think it will affect like college recruiting in the track and field world? Because we'll be like, hey, come to Oregon, and now you're a Nike athlete. You're now – because everyone dreams of going – like any, in order to go pro and track, you're basically shining a shoe deal. So do you think certain schools will be able to kind of lean on and be like, hey, you now have officially signed a shoe, de shoe deal with Nike because you're at Oregon? Do you think that will be a, a recruiting battle that will kind of happen for uh, yeah. track and Absolutely. field? A absolutely, and I don't, I don't have a problem with that because I can say come to Houston because we're the fourth largest city in America and we have tens of thousands of businesses that we could leverage for you. You know, so so you flip it and you say come to come to Oregon for Nike, but Eugene, Oregon's a small town. So it, it's really funny how it flips. It can flip in a lot of ways. Los Angeles would be big. You're like UCLA, USC. You say, look, we we're USC and UCLA. We're a huge city. We got a lot going on. You said you want to be an actor later. Well, you can come here, and I I know people. So I, I think it's just the way they're going to leverage it. Because right now, the way the system is, it's just based on a conference thing, and 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 everyone doesn't have access, and the money is is funneled to certain areas. Well, I think it creates more opportunity for us, for schools um, that are in different cities and different opportunities. It'd be great for Houston. I mean, we're a big city that loves sports and a ton of money here. I think that our athletes would be supported and, and pushed. You're going to tell me right now, Final Four, every one of those athletes wouldn't have a car deal, a meat deal, or something, something, something. Absolutely. And, and maybe not all a shoe deal, but they sure would have something. And I think a lot of our track athletes with H-Town Speed City would have something. So – there's going to be an advantage in, in different areas, in different ways. This is how you leverage those advantages. And you know what? For a, a, It's probably going on a lot behind the scenes. And, well, we know because we have a, um, a big issue going on with that. So now it'll just be out in the open. And I think that it'll be a big advantage for the athletes. I think it would also be kind of cool because say someone like Noah Lyles, let's say this rule was in place when Noah Lyles was a senior in high school. He still goes to Florida then. He signs his shoe deal, but he runs for Florida. And then all of a sudden the NCAA is having all these phenom athletes who go pro early, just like stay in college a few years longer. Like there's no reason for Grant Holloway to leave Florida. He's still going to be, it's not like he's still being coached by Mike. So now you could just be still represent Florida. You can still represent Florida and still go off to the world championships. Like it's just the, you could get paid like, you know, all these yeah. kids who go pro 18, 19, there's no reason for them to leave school now because they can still compete for the school, still train under their coach. They just have a, a different shoe on their foot. Yeah, and that's and that's what I say. And then the other things like, for instance, uh, 2018, Cameron um, and uh, uh, let me see, Eli. Cameron and Obi and uh, Kamari all made the national team. Well, they had to turn down the prize money because they couldn't go it. You can't make any money from a diamond league meet because look at look at track and field. You can, you can go to international events, make money. You can go to uh, national team events and make money. And you can get a shoe deal or endorsement. And you can do all of that while in college. So it's funny how a lot of the Olympic sports would, would benefit much, much more than the pro uh, professional league team sports because there is no access for them in the summers and events, whereas track athletes could be – they go to the world championships. They can keep their bonuses. They go to all these events. They can make their money. So you can have track athletes – could be, and tennis, let's say, could be the richest athletes in college sports 
and which is other than a few football players or whatever that get big endorsements. But but the, the bottom line is that a lot of the Olympic sport athletes will do very very well by being able to um, a- have access to earnings while they're still in college. And I think I love it, and I think it's great. And then now you say I want to not only go to the great school, but I want to go to the place where I can maximize my talent, the earliest and the best. So there are a lot of pros and cons, but I think the pros are big. I want them to earn their living. I want them to stop treating you know amateur athletes and college athletes kind of like like in a lot of ways uh, just products and something you could use to sell to make more money for yourself and i think it's time to do it cool well I, carl i appreciate you taking the time the, for people who don't know this is actually round two of the podcast we did one yesterday didn't go too well the recording didn't work but hey houston made it to the final four since then so it was a positive podcast and uh when's the next time we're gonna see uh houston on the track when's your next meet well um we're running this weekend the alumni meet, uh, you may remember a couple of years ago, that was the uh, after the we're, we're running that. And um, we're going to, and then we're going to Texas A&M, and then we're going to LSU for the first time in a long time. So um, right now the relays are in good shape. The 4 by one is, is number one in the country. So we're going to focus more on individuals. And this weekend is going to be fun because Sean, um, our freshman sprinter, who most people don't know, is a long jumper. So he's going to long jump this week. So it'll be the first time some of the other events going. Travis hasn't run in 204 years. He's going to run. Jakari is going to run his first open race in four years. Um, so it's, it's going to be kind of an exciting few weeks. And you're going to start seeing our individual times things happen because we're going to, we're going to back off the relays for a little bit. Are we- uh, and I'm going to look at some other relay guys until I make my decision. Because right now, I, I don't have a number one team yet. I've decided... Uh, between the two teams that ran at Texas Relays and and, and some and Karen's Ware who's who's um, finishing up an injury and Jaquan Hoyt who's coming out of an injury, we have all of these people um, that haven't run. A couple of them haven't run, and so I'm not going to pick a team until probably just before Drake Relays. Are we going to see a four by one at LSU? Yes, but probably not the number one four by one um, okay. because I want to focus on the individual races there and. Well, well it, what I'm doing now at this point is looking at some of his, the other athletes, like Travis has done his thing, you know, Travis, Nick, and um, Sean, we know what they could do and what they've done in the past. Um, it was good to see Eddie Sumner run third leg on the relay. I want to see what Terrence does healthy. I want to see when Jaquan comes back, what he does. Um, I like what our freshman Dylan Brown did on the second team because I don't, I don't have AB, they're one, two, because they're interchangeable. So now my time is to see some of the other guys how they're going to do, and I'm changing them with legs from week to week to see all right, who's going to go with what I think of the core. So I'll probably run a really good team there, and we feel that a second team ultimately can break 39, and that's the goal for them. Oof. And I don't, you know, I haven't seen anywhere in the rule book where it says you can't have a second relay team, and that's what we want to do. That's what they want to do. So our goal would be to have two relay teams at nationals if, if we could make that happen. Um, and so I'm getting all eight people ready out of 10 to do it. Well, hopefully we can see that happen. It'll be pretty cool. I was going to – well, right now, though, this coming week, it's not H-Town Speed City. It's H-Town Final Four City. because <laughs> of the, uh, for, Right now it's going to be a basketball town for one more week. Um, hopefully – uh, oh, Texas uh, – Baylor. We need What we need is we need to know who's going to win the Baylor-Houston matchup by just – we need you to get your. We need to see the Baylor four by one versus Houston four by one one more time to kind of pre- preview the four and the final four. Yeah, so yeah, know. I, 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 I uh, think that it's going to be a little different. I, it's going to be challenged because uh, Baylor's a phenomenal team, but uh, our defense, as you show, can shut people down. And I think that that um, we we've, we've had an okay shooting through the um, through the, all the playoffs and everything, and uh, through March Madness. But um, we can shoot when we're on. I know Sasser did some things and, and uh, Grimes and these guys going. I think we have two big shooting games coming in with that defense. Uh, it's going to be really tough to beat. Well, here's to that. Well, best good luck this weekend. Thanks for uh, joining me on this podcast. Appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Thank you.